during the depths of winter inside of myself, I found an eternal summer inside of myself. I found something that was animate, that was alive. There was no, there's, I, I didn't need anything all of a sudden anymore. And the world was full. Like, and, and what I mean by this is that with my imagination switched on, like I could sit in the room by myself and, and just entertain myself with, with thoughts or with associations or with paying attention to things. My, my mind was now on, my, my muse was on my shoulder and me and her could laugh all day. And I suddenly became funnier again. I, like I used to have a humor when I was young and I kind of lost it during this dark period and it came back to me very easily. Now I'm quite a jolly dude. I can just crack jokes the whole time because my mind is just whirring away. And it's literally like it's an animated experience. Like the mundane is just funny to me now and it's fun to play around. And actually, in fact, I've gained this ability to see in the, the mundane, the universal, the, the big principle. You can throw a, a simple idea at me and I can kind of throw up like, you know, collage it all the way to the cosmos and down to talking about Beatles and all this stuff. And then during this period, I was walking outside and I saw on the floor like a beetle, a winged beetle that had its, its wings damaged. And I had like, I burst into tears. I remember looking at it. I was like, holy shit, I could see what Terence was talking about. There was this like tragic problem of life sitting right in front of me. And I, I, I still don't know how to describe it. It's just, it just hit me for some reason. Alrighty, everyone, thank you so much for joining us here. We're going to discuss the Red Book. It's a Red Book discussion. And I have with me somebody that knows the Red Book, I'd say quite well. His name is Stefan. <laughs> Steph goes by Uber Boyo. Um, how are you doing today, sir? Good, sir. Thank you very much for having me on. And um, it is a privilege to sit down and talk about Young's psychotic break with a fellow <laughs> uh, Fellow adherent, a fellow uh, a follower, fan of, of the man himself. So, uh, yeah, let's dive into it, man. Yeah, real quick. I'm going to go over my story because I really never spoke about it. So, um, real quick, I want to go into that and then we'll kind of sure. see where the discussion goes. I do want to show you last night I had this paper in front of me and I'm like, all right, Uber Boy is coming on. We're going to talk about the Red Book. I got to get some ideas ready to go. What am I doing? <laughs> and then I said, wait a second. We're talking about a book that's basically unconscious. So here's my paper. You could see it. It's completely <laughs> blank. Uh, maybe we'll fill, fill it out. But uh, my story is I left the TV business. I was a weatherman. And when I left the business, I went into myself. I was sick of seeing fake news, fake fit people. Uh, there was a lot of fakeness in the world. And I just wanted truth. So I got away from everything. Religion. I didn't look towards anyone. I didn't watch YouTube videos. I didn't even read books. I just went right into myself. Yes. And, <laughs> and after a while, it was unbelievable. There, there were moments where there was something else there. And it was this back and forth where I'm kind of doing this dance. Uh, that's something that also came up with me a little bit more uh, of movement in life. But I'm doing this dance with myself. And, and it was like the locals was speaking to me um, after I found it from Jung. But my story led all the way to Jung's Red Book. And when I'm reading it, I'm like, wow, this is unbelievable how it matches with where I am in my life. Um, and it's just quite amazing to to see this book as something that was written before his psychology even came out. And you can see his entire psychology in this book. Um, and, it, and it's still relatable today. So I figure this kind of conversation will help bring it forward. And, and, and yourself as well, you are doing a project on the Red Book, which we're also going to talk about. Um, maybe oh, yeah. we can get into that right now and then uh, sure. see where this, this whole conversation leads. Sure, sure, sure. I'd actually like to make a commentary on what you're even suggesting there, because um, <clears throat> I think, you know, like a, a lot of people get into Carlos himself, old Mr. Young, old man Young. They, they get into him for you sort of have a gut instinct or an intuition or a hunch that you needed to turn around to your life and stick the finger up at it a little bit and go your own way, which is precisely like literally what the Red Book is about. Now, of course, when someone reads the Red Book, like if people might like, <laughs> stumble upon this video and they listen to it and they go read the red book. And it's like, how is this a coherent plan about breaking free maybe from your job and going your own way? This is the most crazy shit I've ever fucking seen. All right. Uh, first of all, am I allowed to curse? If I'm not allowed to curse, please <laughs> yeah. tell me. All right, good stuff. Um, but you know, this is, this is mad shit. Like I, I don't, this is, this is mad as a bag of spiders. Like I know, I don't think this is any way a coherent plan. This just sounds like crazy talk by crazy people. And I get that. And I think there's great value in being someone who's like, pragmatic and down to earth. In fact, I think an awful lot of people need this stuff. But at the same time, I find that um, there's this very big problem in the world. It's going to kind of sound kind of cliche, but 
everybody is like a consumer instead of a creator is the simplest way I see it uh, operant. I know, I, I know people who've never made anything in their whole lives, you know, and they've, they're actually very, very smart people, but they've constructed themselves out of the things that they consume. Now we all do that to an extent. There's no denying that. Like I do that plenty, but at the same time, like I, I know people who would be um, literally like almost all they do all day is get up and go on the internet and consume stuff and think about what's going on and then like talk about it. They're like, they're, they're, they're people who judge things that they consume. They're on Reddit, they're on the, they're watching the news, they're on Twitter, all these type of things. And um, you even see it with this sort of persona of the crypto investor. I know loads of people like this and, and these people even complain about it to me all the time. And these are like friends as well. And they're saying, I hate the fact that I've gotten into crypto because what it's got me doing is sitting down there staring at the Bitcoin chart all day, putting me in this reactive state where I'm staring at something else. And so this sort of identity of being an investor, what do you do? You wake up and you listen and you take in information about the market and you get out external stimulation, which will explain to you what your life means or what's going on. And then you react to that and then you judge that and you make decisions. And of course, you can make an awful lot of money with that. Like, let's not, let's not slander it. But at the same time, there is something missing. And I noticed this an awful lot because these guys, they never produce anything out of themselves. They never, they have no control over what's happening and they're, they're in a reactive state and they're never creating something. And you might even look at someone like an annoying social media influencer. At the very least, that person is out there asserting themselves in some way, you know, now it doesn't necessarily mean that they're telling the truth because there's an awful lot of people out there who just recite what they hear in other places and become like a, a ripple along the talking points, if you will. But there's a kind of final place that you could take this. If you're, you were to say to yourself, right, right. If I was going to become a source of information to the world, as opposed to the world giving me information, I was going to be a source and give information to the world. How would that work? If I was suddenly locked in a room and I wasn't allowed to listen to the news or Reddit or Twitter for a year, what the fuck would I talk about? What would I do? What would I produce? You, you had no e external media influences. What would happen? And that's where things start to become very interesting because even a lot of those influencers, a lot of those social media talkers, a lot of the people you know, they, like, wh what would they talk about if they only had, they had to sit with themselves? And they'd be like, who's going who's gonna to socially signal to me what to think? I'm, and apologies, I'm going on a bit of a rant, but I think this is a huge idea. Even the last year, I've seen this behavior get kind of crazy to the point where it's like you're living through a mimetic uh, what do they call it? Mass formation psychosis and all this stuff. Yeah. And and this is this is fascinating because if you took away stimulus from everybody and just sat them down in the room by themselves, where would they go? What would they? Where would they get stimulus from? And actually, do you know what the answer is? Is that you can find a radio channel, a YouTube channel, a, 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 a media. You can find something to consume. There, there's voices in your head is the way they might say it. As Jung would say, there's an anima inside of you, a living spirit inside of you that is um, able to articulate itself and speak. And it's genuinely creative. And it's actually weirdly part of your personality. You could like, you might look at McGillicris and say, it's your right hemisphere. You look at Jung and say, it's your soul. You look at like the true spiritual nature and say, it's like the, the muse, the guardian angel, whatever it is. It's sort of there. And when you can connect with that and bond with that properly and start to unify your voice with that, all of a sudden you become a first principle. You become an establisher of a reality. You become a, a well. You become a signal instead of noise. Mm -hmm. And it might take you a while to get that right, but over a long enough period of time, you perfect that and you might actually might do something that genuinely adds value to the world and people will start to listen to you. And instead of being a reactive consumer or a repeater or a, a you know, a, I call them jargonites and noggonists, someone who's just like blathering on stuff that they they collected out of like the librarian of concepts, you are a source. You are an, a, a, you're an animated individual is the way you might say it. And I think... What happened with Young is the Red Book was his way of experiencing that. And I think this is, I think that, or I think we, we crave that inside of all of us. And that is fundamentally what we, we see in Young and his ideas. And of course, this book. Yeah, I love what you just said. And I see the same thing with people that are rich. You know, they have this whole outer persona. Uh, they have all these little things that keep them comfortable. But if you drag all that away from them and they're just left with their self, like, how can they actually sit in that space? Would they be able to sit in that space without all the comforts around them? Um, I don't know. You know, I know a lot of people that I was coaching that were business leaders that were making a lot of money, millions of dollars, and they were not happy at the end of the day, no matter what they had money wise, no matter what they had going on, even sexually, um, they, they were not happy at the end of the day. And it's this essence that you're talking about right there is, is that meaning and purpose that you can't find out. You, you truly cannot find it outside and you have to go 
into this dark place, uh, into your own soul uh, that's difficult to find, difficult to, to, to capture. But um, I, Uber Boy, I'm, I'm, I'm curious what you think nowadays. You think back then oh, they were writing letters to each other. They were riding horseback. Uh, our days today, we are blasted when we wake up in the morning, uh, constantly throughout the day with, with information and, and, and look at this and look at that. And, and, and our attention's just dragged all over the place. What do you think about our times today uh, in trying to get back to that source and trying to get back to that essence? How can, how can one even begin without completely yeah. get, removing everything? Well, I, I don't. I, um, like a lot of people have this idea that maybe in the past we weren't as distracted. And I think, yes, to an extent that is true. But at the same time, like even the story of the Red Book is quite clearly telling you that in the 1910s, Jung was surrounded by people who were possessed by the zeitgeist, possessed by the, the era of the times, possessed by the jargon of the day. And, and this is human nature. It's not really like media amplifies human nature, but it doesn't necessarily change human nature. And um, I think maybe things might, might be getting worse, but it's not like um, these problems weren't there before. Newspapers, for example, were, were like there's a shot I've seen on, on the Internet of all these people sitting in a train reading the newspaper instead of talking to each other, you know, and that's like the same as being staring at the phone. It's the same thing, same archetype, if you so wish. And even Nietzsche himself, like Nietzsche was complaining that the printing press was such an annoying thing because it, it sort of, um, you know, he, he called it a... Uh, plebeianized the, the the art of writing and turned it into something that was like generalized and then people become you know bad books can then achieve uh, domination and they can spread idiotic ideas among everybody like so with the scaling of books even though it equalizes everybody that means junk can actually fill everybody's head whereas maybe you know the ignorant pres peasant who never read any book and just lives in touch with the land was actually more free from any of that crap these type of things so I think um, there was always these problems before and the influence this stuff has on people's minds is always there. And, and really what happens in the Red Book is Jung uh, snaps, uh, his, his ego, his persona is attached to this zeitgeist. He's trying to, quote unquote, fit in with Freud and the boys. And what he does is something in him, his soul, this animating soul, literally be, like scares him, pulls him away, tortures him and drags him away from that experience and forces him to confront something that's scary and intense. And of course, it pulls him away and this makes him go on this great, dangerous adventure and it shows him all these strange, surreal experiences, which ultimately gives him his own perspective and his own take and frees him by actually basically sacrificing him to himself like a shaman. Um, and, and this is like, this is a big thing. Like, I don't think... It's it's hard to say, can you expect everybody to do that? In some sense, maybe you, you should expect everybody to do that because that's it's like a free will question. If you can't go pursue your soul, you, you shouldn't expect to be a free individual. And this is quite interesting. You know, nowadays people say, oh, we're all free individuals. It's like, maybe we're not. Maybe you have to create that. Maybe you have to earn that first. Maybe you have to, as we would say, individuate before you can uh, have the snottiness to think that. Yeah, oh yeah, I could uh, second that. You know, um, there there is this true inner freedom that that comes through finding your soul after the blackness, and you have to go through it. You can't uh, you know, sit around and 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 read dogma or uh, pray to some uh, holy god that <laughs> that that people make up uh, to to feel comfortable. This is a, a true a true a true test of of essence. Uh, within. Now, I'm wondering, and I'm curious with you, um, how did you get to the Red Book? How did you find the Red Book? Because for myself, oh. uh, like I told you earlier, it was kind of like thrown on me and I didn't know Carl Jung. I didn't know psychology. I'm like, what is this? Um, what about yourself? <clears throat> so th this is this is a, is a great question. Holy shit. Um, so everything I just said there, I, the, re the reason why maybe I, I'd have a strong slant against uh, people who our information guys, as I call them, is because I, when I was a sort of teen, didn't like who I was. I didn't like my personality. I thought it was flat. I thought it was unoriginal. Like as, as, a, as a, a guy in your teen years, you want to be seen as cool. You want to be seen as impressive. You want to be seen obviously as sexually interesting. You want to be seen as handsome and, and badass by the boys. You want to be someone of high status. And I wanted that too. And I craved that. And I was, I was like popular enough in school, but when I went to college, it's like college is bigger. It's harder to be popular. I was wrestling to try fit into the hierarchy. And so I conceptualized in my head, as we all do, that um, I need a persona. I need, how do I present myself to people? When someone comes up to me, what's the elevator pitch of Stefan? What's the persona, you know? And I'd be like, oh, well, I'm a, what, what am I? And of course, at that point, I was like playing guitar a lot. So I just started to tell people I was a musician. And this was kind of a problem because when I'd meet new people, 
I'd start to say that I'm a musician, but like I, I was like, you know, an average enough a guitarist. Like, I wasn't too bad, but it wasn't too great either. And I was like doing literature and all this type of stuff. So my life sort of didn't really make sense the way I was presenting it. And so I was shy about it. I didn't really ex- explain it properly. I just sort of ran with this persona. And then I started to develop this neurosis where I was like, I need to, I like I'm telling people I'm a musician, but I don't, Every I, I look at everybody listening to music, you know, and they don't listen to my music and they listen to all these really interesting bands and these really interesting artists. It's very unique. They've got the, an awful lot of character and I don't have any of this stuff I don't know how to present myself I don't know how to dress I don't know who I am basically and so I started to get a kind of neurosis about this I started to say how do I build up my persona how do I do what I got to do and so I actually kind of dropped out of college and I well I kind of I I eventually I just started to solve this problem. How do I become original? I felt like I couldn't be original at all. I couldn't be creative. Actually, I'd like what I look a bit back now is that it was like I was felt in my left, stuck in my left brain from, from being educated that way by school. And I was trying to be creative and I was doing all this stuff like, you know, writing out all the different bands and artists and music genres and taking what I got from them and, and explaining this and, and trying to make my own songs by like copy and paste. It was very left brain approach to music and there was no originality to it at all. I was like, what type of musician will I be? I'll be like a, a trans artist who combines psychedelic rock with like, you know, you're collaging together things instead of, instead of holistically understanding something originally. And mm-hmm. um, so I was doing this and then a part of this was me sitting down and saying to myself, you know what I'm going to do? In order to make myself cooler and more interesting, in order to make myself talk better, I'll go to the people who talk. So I'll go read some books. And this is basically how I got in my head that I'll improve and make myself more interesting. So I went and I um, read uh, Nietzsche, read Jung, read all of them. And this was very important period because I was like reading through them trying to figure out what's going on. And I read through Jung and read through Nietzsche and I read through Zarathus and all this. And it didn't like none of it really worked. Like I didn't have, I found some gold in it, but I like a lot of it kind of went over my head young talking to me about like my mother and stuff like that. And I'm like, you know, like, it's cool. I'll try to do this whole work with the archetype of the mother. But like, I, how is this relevant? Nietzsche is like talking about, you know, Germany from the 19, the 18, the 19th century. I'm like, I don't know how this is relevant. And the red book sort of came then to me um, as a part of that, like someone I know brought the red book to me and sort of said, check this out. And I was like, what is it? And, and it was a, a young book, but instead of all like this, this, these, these arguments and this jargon and this technicalities, it was a presentation of all these vivid images. And it instantly actually reminded me of uh, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, which was ultimately like a, a, a piece of art, a visual piece of art. And this, this was the same thing, a visual piece of art by Jung. It was Jung's Thus Spoke Zarathustra. And I saw that and I kind of realized very instinctively, I was like, because first of all, my friend thought this was the best part of Young, and he didn't read any of the rest of them. And um, and I thought it was as well. And almost everybody I met was the same. And I started to see that there's something like special about this thus spoke Zarathustra and Young, and all the other theory by the guys is pretty cool, but there's something magical about these. Something happened there. And it was kind of at that point in my head that I was like, hmm, I don't know what that is, but I'd like that someday. And over the course of my life, I think I've gotten closer to this, you know, and this is something I'm constantly working towards, but it was like a, a magnet, magnus opus or something like that. It was like the, the, the explosion, the, the representation of storytelling by the visual imagination, as opposed to the jargonizing, blathering left hemisphere word guy, the information guy within Jung. Um, so I, I think that's what I saw it as initially. And it was part of that period for me when I was trying to install my own information guy and present myself as a kind of intellectual academic. And then over time, I started to realize, no, I want to be something else. I want to be a creative. I want to be someone who produces something visionary, something that you can't argue against, something that you don't sit down and have this neurotic over a dialectic over and back. Instead, I want to be something that is, you show it and people just get it. People are like, there's no, you don't, you don't debate with a beautiful woman. Like she's beautiful. There's no, you can't rationalize beauty. You can't rationalize a great film. You can't rationalize great music. It's beyond that. And that's precisely what I think the the Red Book captured. It had animating soul. Yeah, And and everyone has it in them. That's the thing. Everyone has that instinct, even if they're unconscious of it. If you're producing from that essence, like Jung was producing with the Red Book, like uh, thus spoke Zarathustra with Anisha, like yourself, if you didn't get and find your own essence, your own essence, nowhere your own essence, and allow that to come through, people unconsciously, gravitate towards that, at least in my opinion. Um, and and, and I, I would imagine if you didn't get to that essence, um, you wouldn't have the, the quite of the effect that you had uh, speaking on this material. 
Yeah, hundred percent. It's it's like what essentially happened to me over the unfolding of my life is um like I went through my own shit and had many problems that happened and failures and and successes and stumbles and basically had a, had a lot of bad things that went wrong. And around that time, I was doing an awful lot of training in these type of things. And it's almost like uh, I guess the better way I describe it is uh, Pavarotti, the great singer. He was training really hard to sing. He wanted to become a, a high C tenor, which is a very uh, re- renowned thing in, in, in opera singing. And he was training really, really hard. And he bust his ass and he went and he trained as hard as he could. And he bust his ass and he trained, and he trained, and he trained, and he trained. He got very, very good. But he trained super hard and he eventually got what we call vocal nodes, which is where you oh, you train so much, you basically, you know, the calluses you get in your fingers, mm. you basically get one of those in your vocal nodes and you get a raspy voice. Mm. And and this is basically like, it's like breaking a leg in, in kickboxing. You know, it's like, it's you're, you're out. You're out for a long time as well. It's very, very bad news. And um, this happened to Pavarotti just as he was like, he was fighting, he was going as hard as he could. And then it all broke down for him and he gave up. All right. And I, this sort of happened with me. I was training and I was like, I want to be, you know, uh, someone who's cool, someone who's original, someone who can speak. And I was going and I was going to all these like teachers and getting them to train me stuff. And I learned a lot, of course, just like Pavarotti did. But eventually, like it stopped working. I wasn't making any money. I wasn't producing anything creatively. I had all these neurotic problems in my head. And I gave up. I, I lost. I lost money. I lost my house. I lost I, I, like relationships. And it just all collapsed. And so I had to just slump down and be like, fuck, I've, I've screwed. I failed. It's, it's over. And Pavarotti did the same. And then what happened with Pavarotti is that he was, um, now he only ever sung because he was interested in it. He only w- went singing when, because he wanted to, he, he enjoyed singing. And so he just would go down to his local choir or church every now and again and just like have a belt, you know. And uh, one day he was doing that with no intention whatsoever, just singing things that felt nice, that were fun. And it was like a casual skill that he had. And one day he was doing that in his church and uh, some guy came in and this guy, of course, was like one of the leaders of the main operas in Italy. And he heard him and he was like, immediately, that guy, bring him here, right? We're signing you up, bro. This type of thing. And it was sort of similar with me. Like I, I kind of like was training really hard, trying really hard and then everything kind of broke down. And then I um, sort of sat down and stopped. I started to look over my life because I was sort of saying to you, you know, this all started when I was a teenager and I was trying to figure out who I was and I had no originality and I and I decided I'll be a musician a persona and then what happened is this persona died you know it was the death of the ego death of the persona and I sat down and I was sort of in this introspective space and I was sort of saying who am I what am I and I looked over my life and I saw you know I, I remember a lot of the musicians I admired there's always these stories about them like singing with their mom in the kitchen or singing from like four years old. And I was always jealous. I was like, I wish I was like that. I only started when I was like 12 or 13 or 14 doing music. And so they were, they were like naturals, you know, and that really pissed me off. I was like, man, I'm not natural. I'm not good enough. That's ultimately the statement. And uh, I looked back over my life at this point because I I was living under this thesis that I was not good enough because I wasn't training earlier. So I had to work hard to catch up. And then all of a sudden I looked over my life and I was like, Oh, wait a second. When I was a kid, I was always like the the colorful guy. I was always the guy who could paint pictures. I was literally the person who would like draw pictures the whole time. I've, my mom's old computer is just full of pictures, full of all these things I made. In school, when there was an art class, I was usually brought up to the top of the class and the teacher was like showing me off and stuff like this. I was always that dude. And I saw that this is the thing that naturally animated me. This was sort of like, you know, the, the, the thing inside of me. My imagination was very strong. And at that moment, I was like, oh my God, that's what I am. That's my quote unquote self. I got a flash of the self, if you will. And I decided that I'm going to build my life on that principle instead of this stupid other principle. Because I was like running in the wrong direction. I was trying to be a musician when I, I'm actually truly like more of an, maybe you could say an imaginative dude. I know. And what's weird is that since that I've done music that's actually good and I like, as opposed to before where all the music was shit. But because I'm starting from, starting from the right place, it's better. And basically what I saw happening was I was getting in touch with that visual imagination inside my head. And it became like this eternal source for originality. It was so strange. It was like, I did stuff like reading dreams and all this. And, but this is finally where it all just kind of clicked in my head. It was like, Oh, that's how you connect with your imagination and let it talk through your head. This is how you speak in a way that can paint pictures. This is how you can sit down and, and write in a way that get captures people's mind. I understood films inside out. I understood music so much better. It was like I tapped into something special, something um, like the muse, as the artists always talk about. I, I gained access to it. And, and I think that's ultimately when I gained what the Red Book was about. And I was, I was like, my life has not been the same since. It's just been a constant, slow upward growth for that reason. 
Yes, yes. And every time I go back to the Red Book, it's unbelievable. I see something new in it. It's almost like the Bible. You, you go back to it. It's it keeps changing, and it's it's like a, I said earlier when we were speaking. It's kind of alive in a sense. Uh, it's a book yeah. that's alive for our time. Do you know what I'd say is I, I think it's unfinished. I, I think I actually look at it like, all right, because you wanted to ask about this. Like, obviously, I'm doing this as a bit of a um, bit of a like I'm going to do an animation series on this. Well, I'm going to give it a good shot here. So I'm currently commissioning this and getting this in order. And uh, by the way, I'm talking an awful lot. So like, you know, by all means, shut me down if you so wish. I Maybe no, a propensity. No, gaining gaining the anima has turned me into a blather mouth. So <laughs> if, if that is pissing you off, please say it to me. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm doing an animation series and when you're trying to construct the story, like there's a, there's very serious things you have to sit down and do. You have to say to yourself, man, this is this has got to make sense. It has to have a structure. It has to have a coherency and a logic. The Red Book is not a well-told story. It's not put together properly. A lot of it's very hard to follow. In fact, like you look at it and it's, there's these sections where Jung is having these visual, imaginative, narrative flashes where he's experiencing these characters. That's the most interesting stuff. And then there's these huge, big volumes of explanations that actually sound almost like left brain confessions, you know? And that's some of that stuff is good. Some of the best lines come from that as well. But it's not necessarily the most captivating stuff to read. It's actually a bit of a fucking drag, to be honest. And um, when you're going through that, you're sort of seeing this and you're saying to yourself, I need to break this out and chunk it together and put it together. But for that reason, I think that it, it remains very pregnant because it's not finished. It's not something that Jung consolidated and said, this is what this is. He kind of left it actually. Like he, 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 he did it so good. And then he didn't actually see it all the way through because he got into like alchemy and Ouija boards and all that shit. Yeah, he writes that, I think, at the uh, at the end. He writes a little uh, paragraph about the alchemy work and the golden flower he just started writing. Um, it, it, one thing I noticed um, real quick, I was going to put us in a kitchen. You could you can kind of put yourself in, in like an immersive scene in, in the Zoom. I was going to put us in a kitchen because I figured we'd be cooking up some some good stuff, some base metals and, you know, mixing them together. Uh, but in in the book, I didn't I didn't think that he had the uh, maybe maybe have more knowledge, maybe. Uh, he didn't have the alchemy in him when he was writing this book, the red book, but he says things like he was in the kitchen and you should go for a temple sleep in the kitchen because that will be great uh, for you. He speaks that to, I believe the librarian. Um, and, and you know, that, that, that kitchen is the alchemical kitchen. And then the temple sleep is an analogy to the um, incubation that, that the ancient Greeks were a part of Permenides and, and Pedicles. Um, they would do those incubation sleeps where they would dream for days. Um, and get that information from the muses. Whoa. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's so cool. I didn't yeah. know that. That's nuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he'll talk about these these topics. So I, th- I feel like he does have a little bit of that in him. Now, I don't know if he if it was in him as in it was ingrained in him already, or if it was in, in him as in he's been reading this material and now he's trying to kind of visualize it and put it to put it to terms, you know? Yeah. Um, well, from my understanding of what, what happened to him, is like it's you know it, this is a very cliche to thing to say nowadays but i think it's true like he sort of goes through a shaman's experience in the purest sense and of course this is what was happening with these ancient dreamers and 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 these incubations in in ancient greece and all of this type of stuff they were they were experiencing the shamanistic experience maybe without the help of drugs and stuff and um young goes through something very much like that like there, there's a huge process of extreme death and rebirth specifically right at the start where he meets the the deep spirit and has the great big revelation you know of, of, of all the death that is coming down the road and i think um yeah man like he, he's really sitting down and allowing basically just getting himself out of his own way and allowing something to swallow him up and take him over and and i think this is one of the most fascinating parts of the story specifically like you know coming from a perspective of trying to talk about maybe like a film or a novel is that um you know you're always looking for tension and one of the great tensions that you imagine with the character young is that this is a dude who was 40 years old he was you know he had an all right gig he had a couple of patients there that he was like sleeping with and he had his wife on lock so he had the 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 kids he had the the good family making all this money with freud calling people perverts like it's all good and um they're 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 sort of doing all this stuff and he's actually kind of prestigious as well and they've basically got a big win and it's hard to win things in this life you know to create psychoanalysis and then be in the right place at the right time and succeed Young's doing all right. Like he's going to have this eternal legacy. And Freud's sort of suggesting this. It's like, bro, we're going to go mainstream. This is going to be class. And Young is, has spent his whole life becoming scientized. 
He's become rational. In fact, he says this, that he treated fantasies, his own fantasies, his own internal imagination. He treated that as a trivial matter, not worthy of, of exploring. And he preferred his more left-brained procedural scientific approaches towards things. Think, for example, of even some of his early innovations, like the word association stuff. It's very sort of left-brained. It's not like it doesn't work, but it's it's you can see how it's sort of a little bit kind of like stiff in that way. And, and science back then and psychological science back then was done this way. It's like it's still done this way largely, but it, um, but it's it's kind of like operant and process oriented these type of things. And Jung had disciplined himself, like sort of like me, you know. He created persona and he started to become the persona. He be created this idea of a scientist and he sort of became this. And inside of him as well, there's all this tension because he also sees that all of his Freud, maybe not Freud, but all of the psychoanalysts, they love like someone like Nietzsche or Goethe, and these are these great writers you know and they're really fantastic artists like Nietzsche is just like profound to everybody and Jung deep down you know like it's obviously he wants to present the scientist and he wants to be accepted by everybody but deep down he's like man I want I don't want I don't just want to be accepted I want to be loved I want people to turn around and be like Carl Jung was like an innovator Carl Jung was a, a a meteor a blast forward and um what you see with the red book is all this tension begins to get set up and then there's obviously another very fucking crazy part of it where there's also a third party here, which is this strange otherworldly force, this deep spirit, that for some reason has decided that Young is going to become the person he's going to introduce the prophecy of the future to. So he's, Young starts to get haunted with basically the, 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 the images of the dead, dead people, which are essentially people who will die in about a year and a half's time from when all this stuff starts happening. And, and Young's task is basically to figure out how to stop them from ending, being locked into hell for the rest of, the rest of their eternity and all this stuff because they're all anti-Christian at this point. And so Young is getting these schizophrenic breaks that he thinks are just genuine psychosis. He's All the people around him are, are like big psychoanalysts caught up in the zeitgeist. Young starting to talk about wanting to break away a little bit and do his own thing, get more creative and stylistic and artistic. He's getting a little bit kind of crazy, ditzy. Um, you know, he's starting to talk a little bit strange. Some of the psychoanalysts he knows, these are the professionals of psychology, are telling him that he's acting a little bit pre-early psychosis. Uh, Freud, of course, and him are having this big tense relationship. And all of this stuff is building up to create this huge wealth of tension. And of course, he, he makes the big decision to go his own way. And he, he runs off. And it's not like he just breaks free and, and goes and starts his own thing, although he sort of does. But in fact, he gets sucked into his psychosis and he actually thinks he's going crazy he's prepared to blow his brains off because it's so scary the thought that he'll go crazy and then he'll end up on freud's couch writhing, and he'll be like no i've lost what's happened and so um he basically gets sucked in and, and this is of course what you see happen is that something deep comes in and says everything that you are needs to be dissolved and for some reason you've been chosen for this really fucked up experience which is about you seeing all the dead people that are to come down the road and and you have to you have to do something about this, man. And like you as this rational, like frigid scientist, is not going to work. You like you you're going to have to let that go entirely. And so his anima basically beats the shit out of him for that. The deep spirit, when it meets him first, shows him all those stone tablets and says, "Look, check all this. This is literally all your cope. Look at all your cope." And Jung's like, "No, it's cope." And it's like, "This is insanity. This is because Jung is like, you're crazy. You're you're my madness." You're the deep spirit. You're the voice in my head. Go away. And then the the, the voice in his head says, "Shut the fuck up. Look at all this bullshit you've been writing. This is this is madness. This is this is cope. You're coping." And so Jung has to confess, break down to that. The anima comes and basically calls him out and being like, "You want to write these cool, awesome books, but you're you're too much of a cuck. You're too much of a coward to do it. You're too much of a rationalist. You soy. You Richard Dawkins. You you new Boy. atheist. We know what's up." And so, um, and that sort of breaks him and sucks him down literally, like literally into the underworld mm -hmm. and gives him a sort of strange modernist shamanistic experience. It's very, um, and I think that's what makes it so cool is that it's very much of the time he was in. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that you said the word pregnant, the, the book's still pregnant. He speaks a, a lot about pregnancy and he feels like he's birthing something throughout the whole book. And like that tension you're talking about, you could feel it in his words, the tension that he was going through in the pregnancy with this divine child or uh, creating the God and opening the egg. And there's so many moments where he, he even says that he was gripping onto his furniture just to make sure he was, he was stable. I mean, it was that bad. And, and it, to let yourself get to that level um, and, and then be able to write about it, it's, it's quite an experience. Um, but the way of what is to come is, is what he's speaking on. 
and you're talking about your experience and you were led, you're trying to be this macho, you got kind of uh, shoved into yourself and then you've... Uh, yeah, that sucked. <laughs> same here though. You know, it was the same thing. I'm on TV. I'm thinking I'm so cool. Oh, look at me. I'm on the nose. Oh yeah. You know, and then it's hell and you realize everything's so fake. Everything's so black and dark. That's why I love the red book because this is where we are. Everyone is on their own rushing ahead, forgetting about their self. And this book brings to light the true self and how, when you come back, if you can come back and it, and it gives you a lot of little great pointers when you come back, it's truly like being home. Um, and it not only like the logos that, that you gain from that experience and you start seeing things in the world. I don't know about yourself, but you know, when I'm writing this series, so I'm writing, um, uh, one of the lectures was on the Mysterium encounter. And that's when he first comes to realize Elijah and Salome. And I'm writing the series. I'm doing the, the video on the Mysterium encounter. And all of a sudden I'm walking, just taking a walk. Someone comes up to me, he's a Christian, and he wants to talk to me, and his name was Elijah. So I'm like, huh, there's the Mysterium encounter, you know? And then the week of church, I'm sorry, the week of church, the week of uh, uh, refinding the soul, uh, when I'm writing that, that week, I went to church. So I go into a Christian church. I'm like, let's see what the soul's like, you know? I haven't been to church in years. So I go in, and there was no soul. And so, I'm, you know, refinding the soul, there's no soul. So I go up to the pastor afterwards. I want to say, hello, how you doing? You know, just have a conversation. And he didn't talk to me. He just looked at me and I had my hand like to shake it. He just looked at me, maybe because I had the red book in my hand, who knows? But, you know, and I'm just seeing all these different synchronicities. And it was just, you know, as I continue to grow through the book and through myself, you start gaining a lot more information, start seeing things, maybe seeing through things is the best way to, to say it. Um, I'm wondering what your experience has been with synchronicities and in, in, in that type of deal. There's a few, like, for example, when I was getting into this stuff an awful lot, um, like, I guess I don't have any crazy stories uh, in terms of like actually doing something like, oh, well, all right, all right. I think this, the 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 profound, profound experiences for me have been more ra like explainable, like they're they're surreal, but they're explainable. Like one I often talk about is this idea of um, Makina, for example. And um, this is a I started reading my dreams, and out of my dreams came and Jung told me to read my dreams. You know, so I sit down, and I do this like the most irrational behavior you could possibly fucking do, and like I'm kind of I'm somewhat of a level headed dude. You know? I'm a, I'm a little bit like on tilt, but I'm somewhat level headed, and so I'll have always have a bit of skepticism. Like if someone's like you know do this, do that, I'll give it a go. I'll be open minded, but I'll be very quick to call bullshit. And I tried the dream reading thing, and I was like, man, I was ready to pull the bullshit trigger as soon as possible, but then. I, uh, then it started like just weird stuff started to happen. Actually, stuff started to happen that I I, I found very very practical. Like I would um, switch on that imagination. So I go into a coffee shop, read some dreams, and then my imagination would turn on and be like, "Man, that's awesome!" It's like uh, going to the gym and getting a pump. Like you just enjoy that. So you're like, "I'm just going to keep going to the gym for that, so I can flex." So it's that thing. I'd walk home from the coffee shop and I'm like seeing all these visions, and maybe it was the caffeine that was helping that as well. But you know, it was it was a combination of both in my mind. Um, and then what began to happen is I began to see. Uh, this um the story form because i was reading like 200 300 dreams and uh, across analyzing them the form a sort of meta picture of what's going on so i was, I was reading through the symbols sort of sort of I, maybe my own sort of red book type thing and um i started to see these uh, super characters start to form like i started to like see this evil character fall i, I called makina and um something very strange began to happen. Like I started to see this character called, uh, it, was, it was almost like this, this figured sla slouched over, I, I might even call it a tech head or something like this, but it's like, a, a, it's more than that. It's like an idealist. It's like an escape as Nietzsche might call it the last man, but some people nowadays call it the pod man, the bug man, whatever it is. And I started to see this in my mind and I didn't quite understand what it was, but I saw that this character had this problem with the world. It was like a philosophical uh, myth. And this character, it's like a little Greek myth. This character was weak and frail. And it's sad. Like, I didn't feel angry at this character. But, but it was weak and frail. And it was struggling with the world. And so it developed this sort of bitterness. And it started to want to escape the world. And it started to dream of a way that it could escape the world. And of course, there was this evil character called Makina that came down, which is sort of like the zeitgeist in Jung. And it began to, to sing to it and say, I will, I, will show, I will save you. I will show you how I can save you from this world. 
and the Makina began to explain to this character, this this decrepit, um, wounded golem, that like if you build the machine I tell you to build, it will take you out of this world into a heaven. That you you will everything will be perfect and you'll be free from your body and your consciousness will live free because this world is actually evil and your consciousness is in prison here and all this stuff. And I was like, you know, reading my dreams, man, what the fuck am I like? What is going on here? This is just insanity. But then I kind of separate from that and I'm going around my life and I start to see, I, I, I literally start to meet people and I'm talking to them and it's like, you know, it's like schizophrenia. You're like talking to someone, you meet like a, a guy who's into tech and you're sitting there casually. I remember I met some guy who was in college. So I was a little bit out of college at this point. I was, I was um, living with some guy who was in college and I was chatting with him and he's a huge tech guy. And he was explaining to me, it's like, look, the way the, way the future is going to go is that we're all basically going to upload ourselves into computers and all this. And it wasn't like the craziest idea, like stuff that has been floating around, but this hit me like a train. Cause like, wait a sec, that's the, that's what, that's what she was promising. Me. All right. And then I'd listen to him more and more of this stuff would show up and like more, it's almost like the exact thing was showing up and I was starting to see this stuff really, really go on. And then for example, getting into young and reading through stuff like the red book, you, you see this, the, the sort of suggestions about mass psychosis, the ideas of uh, how all these ideas can sort of um, lead to people becoming brainwashed and stuff like this and the lack of soul in people in the modern world. And I would like, you just described it there, you know, the lack of soul thing. I, I like, I never really understood that the soul is a very dead concept. Maybe that's in fact, one of the, the symptoms of this problem. But then when you're t- understanding the anima, and I, I really got it for myself what the anima is, and I realized that, like, you know, you can have this animated internal power as opposed to being a, an information guy who sucks stuff from the out. I walk around the, the world and I, I, I speak to people and, and, and they're literally repeating to me talking points, as we call it. Like they're, it's like talking to a news anchor. It's like t- talking to Twitter. It's like talking to a meme. It's like talking to Reddit. And I'm, I'm just like, looking at it being like what the actual what is going on it's so strange you know it's strange it's like you're seeing these people these people are like i don't know pattern built in or something like that i guess you could call them unconscious so yeah absolutely i've experienced this but i'm not quite sure what to call it yet yeah Yeah. accuracy maybe is the way i look at it (laughs) young was accurate Accuracy. Uh, another thing is it, it makes you appreciate life more. I don't know about you, but you know, when you get to that essence after you've um, went to, through your journey of, of kind of getting into yourself and, and really letting that creativity speak. And it's not your, it's not, that's a thing. It's not your creativity. It's, it's creativity. If, if that's the best way to put it. Yes. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, so, 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 you know, you're, you're, so you're going through your journey and you, you go into yourself when did you when did you notice that that uh, that connection to life um you know started so where i'm trying to go and i see you moving around can you hear me yeah yeah perfectly Beautiful. fine sorry just oh, re- no, that's rearranging, all right. re- re- rearranging my seat and so my, <laughs> my ass does not die <laughs> um, numb. Where, Worm bum, as they say <laughs> where i'm trying to go with this is is you know, you're again. You're you're trying to be something, and then you come back, and you're like, "Wait, I, I have to be myself." And then you can actually now be, and you can create from that space. Did you become more appreciative of life and and really open to mm-hmm. life? And I, I remember Jung. He 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 has these visions. The part one is over, so a Libra Primus is done, and then he meets an anchorite, and an anchorite speaking to him, and he tells him to pray to the morning sun. So then Jung wakes up, and he's looking around. And he's like, I don't know what to do. Pray to the sun. Is he a sun worshiper, this anchorite? <laughs> so yeah. then he goes, he goes, dear sun, I have no prayer. This is my prayer. You know, and then that's it. But then he keeps walking around and then he starts saying a prayer to the beetle. And he says this prayer. And he's like, what am I doing? After he says the <laughs> prayer, then he says a prayer to the stone. He says, oh, you know, beautiful stone, whatever he says. But he's, you can right. see that he's starting to kind of open himself up to the world and life and seeing things for really, truly what it is instead of that persona that we all like to build. I'm wondering if, if that's where I was trying to go. If you've had that experience, I know I've had, um, where you really have an appreciation for just a small thing like a beetle or a stone. You know, that's an like, example of this stuff being very, very strange. Like, I remember when I was really going into this stuff, <clears throat> I went outside and I looked at a beetle and there was a... There was a phrase, um, but Terrence, Terrence McKenna talked about this, first of all. Okay, so a lot of things I need to explain here. But Terrence McKenna explained that uh, when he got a diagnosed with a brain tumor, 
he was obviously a bit like I was that's pretty hardcore that's that's a bad hit you know that's like I'm I'm out of here and he said that it was one of the most beautiful things ever because he started to regain that um appreciation because he was like all right I, like in a year I am I'm no longer going to be alive and so all, all of a sudden every moment has an awful lot more value than it did before and every small little thing starts to gain this incredible value. He described it as like, you know, infinity in a, in a grain of sand. And he said that he was like sitting there one day staring at a beetle struggling across um, the, 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 the gravel. And he saw like the entire story of life in that, you know, like he, he saw, and there's no words that can describe this because it just hits you and your heart breaks and you see this little fucking insect, which is the most irrelevant thing ever, but it's just fighting through all these stones to make it to the other side of the steps. And it, like, you're just looking at that and you're like, man, what is life? Like, what's going on here? It's just so surreal. And I remember when I was reading through the Red Book and, and sort of understanding, trying to get into that animated part of my head, if you wish, um, what, what sort of happened with me during that kind of period where everything fell apart and I went into this dark place. Um, I, 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 as I said, I switched on my imagination, but I, I think the best way to describe it is, it was like Camus described it during the depths of winter inside of myself, I found an eternal summer inside of myself. I found something that was animate, that was alive. There was no, there was, I, I didn't need anything all of a sudden anymore. And the world was full. Like, and, and what I mean by this is that with my imagination switched on, like I could sit in the room by myself and, and just entertain myself with, with thoughts or with associations or with paying attention to things. My, my mind was now on my, my muse was on my shoulder and me and her could laugh all day. And I suddenly became funnier again. I'd be, like I used to have a humor when I was young and I kind of lost it during this dark period and it came back to me very easily. Now I'm quite a jolly dude. I can just crack jokes the whole time because my mind is just whirring away. And it's literally like it's an animated experience. Like the mundane is just funny to me now and it's fun to play around. And actually, in fact, I've gained this ability to see in the, the mundane, the universal, the, the big principle. You can throw a, a simple idea at me and I can kind of throw up like, you know, collage it all the way to the cosmos and down to talking about Beatles and all this stuff. And then during this period, I was walking outside and I saw on the floor like a beetle, a winged beetle that had its, its wings damaged. And I had like, I burst into tears. I remember looking at it. I was like, holy shit, I could see what Terence was talking about. There was this like tragic problem of life sitting right in front of me. And I, I, I still don't know how to describe it. It's just, it just hit me for some reason. And it, it kind of like resonates you and you're like, man, like you're, you're so in your head, you're so lost. You're so caught up in abstractions, caught up in Twitter, caught up in information guyism. And like outside in, in the yard, there's a beetle struggling for its final breaths and stuff like this. And it's just, man, it's just crazy, man. Life is just an, a nuts thing, man. Like there's so much life all around you, so much stuff going on. But um, it's almost like we, we, we can't see it. We're, we're not able to see it. We're, we're, we're lost in some abstract set of bullshit that we get caught up in. Yeah. yeah. But once you catch it, you know, like you're saying, you, you have this new found appreciation for life and, and that's healing, you know, individuation is a process of healing the whole time. He's not, I mean, he is developing his ego. And that's something I want to talk about real quickly is the importance of the ego. Uh, everyone nowadays, it's, it's kill the ego, kill the ego, but who's watching everything that's animating, you know, who's the one that's in the middle of everything in the in-between that Jung likes to say um, it's, it's the ego, but um, actually let's just, let's just go right onto this topic. Cause I think it's so important. What are your opinions on the ego and self relationship? Do you think that people should kill their ego and, or do you think that the ego is this conscious fluid that can be um, kind of adjusted in a sense uh, towards as long as it's open towards the self, not this, you know, inflated, one-sided, um, logical ego? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question because, like, all my talk about the left brain and all this, um, you, like, what the habit is, is to demonize the left brain as the source of all evil. But in truth, like, the left brain is a very powerful and functional and important institution within the brain. We wouldn't have it otherwise. Nature is anything but inefficient, and she would have killed off the left brain if it had no purpose. And you could look at the ego as something similar. Like it's a, it's a very powerful institution within our minds. We have a focal point within the way we think about things. And, and yeah, it just kind of does things a certain way. And the big problem with something like the ego is that it's not that the ego, it's like you'll never not have an ego. You're always going to have a point of view. And the problem I had was that my ego and my persona were the only things that were, were first of all, they were misaligned with what I was, which is the main problem. 
So you, you, you think about building your personality is like building a proper spinal cord. So I knew myself, my deep understanding of myself since childhood was that kid with that animated imagination. But the second I started to build an ego and a persona that was, or my ego started to think that a different persona was what I was, I fell out of alignment. And then it was like, it was like, you know, having an injury. I just couldn't function properly. But then I got back to that and I built, and that, that my soul animated me for this reason. Then I connected that to my ego. My ego saw me, the persona I present to people is, is now congruent with that. I, I, I still have those things. There's loads of shit I don't understand, but it's just way more stable because it's aligned with what I actually am. And, um, and if you let that stuff fall out of alignment, that's where you start to have problems. You start to think that you're something you're not, is, is the simplest way you can put it. And it's cliche, but it's true. Um, three things Jung said, the war, the gift of magic, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, 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 the darkness of magic, and then the gift of religion. They're the three things that unleash chaos, and he thinks that they're very important. Um, what are your thoughts on the world nowadays and, and that idea of war? Do you think that there is an unconscious that's built up or ready to go? Or, um, you know, what are, your, what are your opinions as we come on to the, you know, we're getting close to the end here? Um, so w when you specifically say war, do you, like, do you think, cause I guess this in the, the spiel these days that like war is over and, and wars, all this type of, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of takes on war that are, are very challenging because war is considered a negative thing, but I read through the past and I look at ancient history and like uh, war was nearly a sacred thing. Like it was considered in some sense, an essential thing. It, it was like a cleansing. It was like a, it was like a sport a giant competition where man could go and he could prove himself. Cause you think about the struggle of ancient societies is that as a dude, you know, you want to have a, a beautiful girl. And in order for you to get a beautiful girl, you need to be respected and off status among the men in the simplest way possible. And the way that you actually achieve that is like, like nowadays, like going and playing soccer or something like that. But back then you go and you fight in war and all the other guys see you as a ballsy, brave bastard. And you actually go and, and succeed or at the very least, like, you know, express yourself properly and like uh, assert yourself and prove you're brave. And that's no joke. Like that's, that's hard to do. And then you come back and you, you kind of, your life has meaning. You gain, you, you, it's a form of initiation. You gain meaning by sh seeing what you truly are, by going out into the world. And like, instead of an internal journey, you do an external hero's journey and you go and put yourself in the face of death and, and force yourself to remain competent and level-headed and be a, become a dependable character in around that people can rally around, and then you gain incredible rewards as a consequence. And it's um, and and war provides the ultimate opportunity for that because the war has the ultimate consequences. And nowadays, nothing is consequences. Sports doesn't even have a consequences. You know, there's no like I think maybe fighting is one of the few things that at least has some type of dangerous consequence. Both the rest of it is like it's it's all very just up in the air. It's all very like what, what's real anymore? And war would add reality to everything. Now, no one wants war. Anybody who says they want war, they just don't fucking understand what war is. Like uh, reading about the trenches, studying the Red Book, I'm like, man, I don't want that shit. Holy shit, I don't want that shit. But the thing is that if it comes, what, what you begin to understand is that even though you don't like it, it's like a fight, you know? Even though you don't want to get in a fight, it's never wise to get in a fight. If the fight comes up and it's, it's forced in your face, it doesn't mean it's bad. It actually may be an opportunity for you to see, see yourself as a superhuman. In fact, Ernst Younger is a brilliant writer about World War One. He lived through the trenches. He lived, I think he was, he'd been, he was in 17 battles or something like this. And he described like all the, the full spectrum of emotions that were involved in that war. It's an unbelievable document to, to really read his writings. And some of the things that surprise you is that he, he becomes very affirmative of it at times. Like he says, there's nothing... You, you, he could not have seen what he is without having to charge into a, a, a barrage of mortar shells, wearing a gas mask while there's like four people getting shot around them by a machine gun, running in with a bayonet and stabbing someone to death while he's like bleeding because he's clenching his teeth so hard. And then running into the next one and pausing because he realizes he's in his war frenzy and he's about to stab another man who's like holding a, a picture of his family being like, please stop, please stop. And doing that like 50 times. This is, he, he couldn't see himself. He, he was like, what, what type of level of understanding what do you see in that when you do that this is why people get ptsd they're like they see that side of themselves come out and they're like what the fuck was that like that's at the same time a monster 
and also like some type of superhero who's able to overcome fear. It's a, a, a violent d- demon, but at the same time, like uh, the soldier that can protect you know the nation. It's incredible, and you can't theorize about that. You can't book cope your way to that. That's uh, that's only an experience you can go through, and so what we have now is our problem is that there's no realm of testing to, to discover the, 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 tr- the true, the real consequence of virtues. There's no way that we can go and, and have our, you know, uh, the jokes are over. Now is the time for you stepping up and, you know, you're going to have to have, you're going to have to have piss running down your legs because you're going to be that scared. Th- th- this isn't there anymore. And so the, the society actually gets silly because of that, because it lacks consequences. Not like peace is a bad thing. As I said, I prefer it. But you can see where this becomes an issue. So we're in a situation now where a lot of people are, as we, as they say, soft, not, not possessing of virtues. And war would be a timely thing because it would ground people. But at the same time, war is not going to appear like it appeared before. It's, it's going to be, it's not going to be nation versus nation. It'll be like machine owners versus people without machines or the, the 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 upper classes versus the plebs or the certain factions politically or something like that like and i, I the idea of or maybe even racially we forgot for all we know but the idea of like national wars and these big super armies i don't think that's going to happen again um but will it happen uh, knowing human nature i'm almost fucking certain yeah I can feel it. I mean, it's, I don't know how it is over in Ireland, but the United States right now, it is unbelievable. When I go out, it is so dark. It is so quiet. It is so cold. I've never, and I've been, you know, I've been around for 30 years. I've never felt it like this recently. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of people are saying stuff like that. That's mm-hmm. a lot of people, there's something in the air, you know, Joe Rogan, like a very sort of milk toast uh, media figure. He's quite normie. But he he said that about 2016 that like things took it like things just got different. There's a different feeling in the air because the whole Trump thing. I, I noticed this over here in Ireland. Um, I had friends come in and they they point the finger at me and be like, "Do you support Trump or you do do you do you denounce him?" And I was like, "I don't have a fucking clue who Donald Trump is." And then they tell me to support to denounce him, and I'd be like, "I'm not denouncing anyone just because you're telling me fuck you." And I basically like you know it's not it's not like I was like a ma- wearing MAGA hats and all this type of stuff, but I just started to notice that there was this weird energy around it, that there was this um c- cult like energy around it. Like this was not like normal, like because you know Obama, George Bush, people weren't telling me to denounce George Bush. People were like George Bush, what a plonker, got us in a like you know got the world in an Iraqi war, whatever it is. But that was different. Like Trump was this thing where it was like. It was like it was like you know in Northern Ireland where you're you're asked are you a Catholic or Protestant and if you said you're the wrong one they'd like take your kneecaps like it was starting to go that direction we we're starting to get more serious and then since then like Trump even looks a bit innocent now at this point because now what you see going on is like this stuff is just spiraling into higher and harder extremes and and the the consequences are starting to get way way more serious way way more serious because you're starting to instantiate things like um li- literal like, you know, I, I don't want to say too much, but you know, no. what's going on. No. <laughs> uh, it's, it's so tough to, to talk. And that, that's what I'm worried about. You know, the censorship is just getting, but we got to stop. <laughs> we got to just, yeah. it's, yeah. it's, it's we'll, tough. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely, I think, I think the people's imagination, their anima will be able to figure <laughs> out the rest. Um, you know what? We're, we've talked a lot, uh, though we haven't really stuck on the red book. I think it was a great little discussion. I do want to bring back. You said you were you were talked a little bit about your project. I do want to bring your project in as we close on out on um, what you were hopefully uh, expecting to get out of this. I know you were talking about a little bit of an animation, but uh, maybe some little tidbits for anyone listening in on what they could expect. Oh, sweet. Well, um, basically, you know, in in try, trying to stay true to what I'm talking about here, I, I like information guyism sitting down and explaining this stuff is um is one thing and i think it is useful i think an awful lot of people are craving meaning at the moment and i think an awful lot of these podcasts and stuff really help with that but i don't i don't know i've started to i i kind of think i think i get it now that's a dangerous statement but i think i get what's going on right now i see sterility in the world some people might say the culture but whatever and I don't see another podcast. I don't see another explanation, information guy as the way to do it. I see the the thing where we st- like, you know, s- some people have to start producing new artistic forms. They have to produce new art. They have to produce big stories 
told in an artistic way. You can't just explain big stories. Jordan Peterson, I think, was like a good example of someone who explains big stories. Now, that's fine. He does a great job. I'm not saying that's we, we're not allowed to do this or this is evil or this is bad. But the, the, like once, once he had his say, I don't see too much else that needs to be said. I think now the next question is like, you know, it's almost like with hip hop, you know, once people got it that like, it's like, all right, we're going to have to make our own culture. It was just sitting down and saying, all right, well, let's do it. We got to do it now. So I'm starting to look in this direction and saying, all right, what are some big stories that have never been told before that we could start telling in a proper storytelling way, like visual storytelling and um, audio storytelling, narrative storytelling, because this hits people on a level that nothing else does. And this hits me on a level that nothing else does. I feel fulfilled making stuff like this, whereas talking about it is is cool and it gets my imagination going, but it's not the same. So I was looking at the Red Book and thinking, you know, I say we can animate that. I'll, I'll see because I've got a good business running and I'd like to do something with the money. And I like, you know, I'm not too interested in having a Lamborghini and all this type of stuff. So it's like, could I sit down and could I actually, could I actually go and, you know, maybe I'll get a Lambo later. Let's see. But you know what I, <laughs> <laughs> could I sit down? Could I sit down and could I go and say, yeah, yeah, I'll just show up like dressed. Maybe just I'll, like the TV people. <laughs> <laughs> with an anima in the in the other sea. But could I go and could I take that and like commission artists, get a professional team, really invest in it, do a good job, build something that's unique, that really just like speaks to people's imagination and let them see what, what I see and kind of push it forward. And so it was like the Red Book's a great opportunity for that because Red Book, first of all, as I said, is not properly written. And I don't mean this is a slander to young. It is what it is, but it's not like something you can just pick up and read through and be like, wow, that's just a really well-told story. Like it's not, it's, 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 it's thrown together. And so I'm kind of thinking, could I take that and represent, show people the story, show people the character young, you know, um, show people what he went through, show people the scenes that he experienced and start to take them on that journey. And, and instead of explaining to them what it means, show them what happened and let them decide what it means. And kind of trust in that sort of, uh, right hemisphere intelligence or something like that. Because I've talked about it before, but I'd like to see, could I take it to the next level and, and, and as I said, present it, represent it, show it. And then that becomes a very interesting artistic event, if that works. And then it's like, well, where could we take it from there? Maybe we could do those books, Arathustra. Maybe we could do my own stories. Maybe we could start pushing into the film world at that point. And all of a sudden, all this talk about Jung and what he means and all this is starting to manifest as actual products uh, actual made artifacts that we can look back on and be like holy shit that was that was a genuine new moment um in the world that sounds beautiful and that, we need this you know we need this a lot of the Jungians like edinger and and a few of the others uh, mary louise von france they've uh, since passed and and the new age of Jungian psychology it seems like it's going to burst through you know by someone like you so it's uh, really great to see in the world and so, uh, no. <laughs> well, I have to do, I have to do it first. So let's let's keep that in mind. <laughs> Got to do it first. Um, so uh, yeah, that's coming up probably. Would you say a couple months from now? Yeah, like I'm gonna because again, I'm inexperienced. I have no idea how to run a team. I have no idea about any of the logistics. I have no idea about any of this stuff. So mm -hmm. um, I've been like trying to figure out the logistics, trying to figure out how to do this stuff for the last while, and I've sort of got it in my head. I'd say. Maybe I could get like a, a chunk. The best way to release it would be serialize it. So, so sort of do a series. Like I'm not going to produce one film because that'd take like a year. So that just what, am I going to go quiet for a year? I don't think that's going to work. So I'll serialize it, release it chunk by chunk. And I, I could maybe get the first chunk out in a month or two, I'd say. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, hey, I want to say one thing before we close uh, on out. Uh, I produced a series on the Red Book and I sent it to Uber Boy. I'm like, hey, why not? He's somebody that speaks on this. He seems to have a following. Maybe he'll watch it. And I wasn't expecting anything out of it. And he actually shared it and it helped get some uh, attention and really brought a few people to uh, my work. It was my only post. Again, I left the world. I don't have, you know, this whole crew around me. It's just me by myself uh, in New Jersey, walking along the beach, trying to find life. And, um, you know, this book is life. This is a book of life. And, um, you know, for you to be able to share that that series and um, do it with, without asking for anything, you know, nothing expected. It, it was truly a, a blessing. So I do thank you for that. And I thank Not you for all. everything you've done in the community. Not at all, brother. Thank you very much. And uh, look, you put in a good effort, like an awful lot of people who, um, who watched your stuff. Like I, I obviously talked to some of the, the boyos and a lot of them liked it. 
a lot of them thought it was broken down. Because, like, I have a certain way of talking about stuff where I'll, I'll talk about the Red Book. I'll add an awful lot of me in. And and you you were, like, you know, actually went down, went through each, each every specific piece and showed people the specific meanings and represented it properly. And, and that's that's an awful lot, like, more comprehensive than than I've done. So a lo- load of people love that. So good job. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's so many connections that the book takes. You can just, you can go on a rabbit hole with, with just one page, right? It's crazy. It's true. Yeah. It's true. In fact, like that's one interesting thing about the sort of film aspect of it is that in order to contextualize it, you have this opportunity to go anywhere you want. Like, you know, you, you can go all the way back into the 19th century and, I, you know, you spend the first hour of the animation if you really wanted to. I'm not going to do this, but I could doing the drama between Jung and Freud because there's just so much going on at that point. <laughs> like the, the what, what was psychoanalyst? What was the zeitgeist? What, where was science? Why were they so tense? What was schizophrenia? What, like, you know, you can find all this stuff and really just flesh it out. It's so much fun. And, and the Red Book is like, you know, the first section covers all that stuff. You're like, Jesus, right. And then you go into the next one and it's like Siegfried shows up and I'm like, man, <laughs> the, ma- the depth you can go into that with that. With that. So, yeah. so that's where it's at. Beautiful. Hey, thank you so much. This is a wonderful conversation. And uh, hopefully in the future, we'll, we'll catch up again. 100%, brother, 100%. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, anybody who's following this gentleman for me from my end, uh, give him a follow, give him a subscribe. Uh, Humble You? Humble You Media, yeah. Humble You Media. Check him out. I'm sure there'll be links and all that stuff. So, thank you very much, and thank you, sir, and have a good one.